With Star Trek The Original Series cancelled, the cast and crew of this failed series went their separate ways never to return. But through a fascinating set of circumstances, they would be reunited in order to bring Star Hello and welcome to Backtrack, a web series that focuses on the background information of any given topic in Star Trek. In this, the continuation of our look into Star Trek's history, we'll be looking at the period of time after the cancellation of Star Trek the original series through to the beginning of production for Star Trek the Motion Picture. I hope you enjoy. On January 9th, 1969, Star Trek was done. After what the network viewed as poor ratings, the series was finally cancelled. Reaction to the cancellation was surprisingly quiet. There were no letter writing campaigns or bumper stickers being posted everywhere this time. It in fact seemed as though no one cared if Star Trek was around at all. Or at least so everyone thought. Thanks to a deal struck with Kaiser Broadcasting back in 1967, Star Trek would continue to see all its 79 episodes broadcast daily on their UHF stations. This meant extreme exposure for the series. Now people who had loved the show could tune in daily and get their Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and company fixes, while those people who had never given the show a chance could tune in and begin to love the show that they had originally written off. The fan base had truly begun and had begun to grow at a rapid rate. After Star Trek's cancellation, Shatner, like the rest of the cast, went job hunting. Unfortunately, their work on Star Trek would leave them very few options when it came to acting gigs. All the cast were seen as characters from that failed show. This was especially difficult for Shatner, as during Star Trek's last season he had divorced his wife and as a result was practically broke since the settlement was based on his Star Trek salary, a salary which he no longer had. So in order to continue to have some sort of income, Shatner would return to theater performing, touring the United States with a small acting troupe. At the end of August 1969, while on his way home from the last theater troupe performance of the year, William Shatner checks in with his agent. Surprisingly, he learns that Rose Kennedy, the mother of JFK, is a fan of Star Trek and has requested Shatner's presence to sit at her table for a charity function back in New York. Flattered, but desperately needing to see his children, Shatner refuses the invite and continues on his way. By the end of 1969, Star Trek was already beginning to make its resurgence. The cancellation had and would ultimately become the best thing that had ever happened to Star Trek. You see, thanks to its third season cancellation, Star Trek was being remembered as a good show that was axed by the Bad Network. If Star Trek hadn't have been cancelled, continuing to pull down ratings and offending its fan base, there was a good chance that Star Trek would have been remembered as a bad series and as such would have never made it into syndication at all. But instead, the cosmos were kind and Star Trek was flourishing in its new UHF environment. And thanks to Apollo 11's successful mission, the imagination of the public had been re-energized, making them tune into Star Trek on a nightly basis. Kaiser's deal with Gulf and Western Paramount was proving to be one of the smartest and best business deals ever made in television history. Star Trek themed parties and fan clubs began popping up at colleges and university campuses everywhere. Lines like, Beam me up Scotty, which was never actually said as a direct quote in the original series, along with live long and prosper and set phasers to stun could be heard around the office water cooler by fans who were debating and discussing last night's episode. In short, Star Trek was becoming a household cult phenomenon. By 1972, finally, the Star Trek convention was born. Gene Roddenberry would enthusiastically attend these events, he himself also having difficulty finding steady work, and was thrilled to discover the droves of fans Star Trek was still picking up. Roddenberry would actually address the fans, having a sort of question and answer period, where fans could ask him specific questions about specific episodes, and Roddenberry would always have an answer 
even though from convention to convention, sometimes those answers would contradict each other. It was truly an amazing time for Star Trek. Roddenberry was also a very shrewd man. When these conventions started popping up everywhere, he was actually approached by Paramount, who wanted Gene to revive the series with either a made-for-TV movie or even a small-budget motion picture, but Gene would always refuse. You see, Gene had theorized that Star Trek's growing resurgence would continue with the passing of each year, and fans' desperate cries for a new Star Trek year in and year out would eventually put Gene in a much better position to negotiate with the studio. And thanks to a brilliant clause in his contract with the studio, he knew that Star Trek could only be revived if he approved it, and so he held out. But he did make an exception. When Filmation approached Gene to make an animated version of Star Trek for television's Saturday morning lineup, he jumped at the chance. Star Trek could be introduced to a younger audience that way, still ensuring that with Filmation giving Gene full creative control over the animated Trek, Roddenberry took the plunge. But not everyone was happy with Gene. First, many of the original production staff of the show were horrified to find out that when they attended conventions that Roddenberry was taking credit for their creations within the show. Suddenly Roddenberry was Star Trek, claiming he created things like the Klingon or Spock's hand gestures when he himself had done nothing of the sort. Second, the actors were unimpressed with Roddenberry for various reasons. In order to continue to make money off of Star Trek, Gene would begin to sell various blooper reels throughout the country. In today's day and age, we see these blooper reels from our favorite shows as just a little bit of fun. But back in the early 70s, this wasn't the case. Blooper reels simply didn't exist for public consumption. They were embarrassing moments captured on film of its series actors meant to only be shown at production Christmas parties, and that's about it. And Roddenberry, without telling any of the actors he was doing it, was selling these off like hotcakes to pay his bills. And some of the Star Trek cast had a really big problem with that. Leonard Nimoy really took this hard. He saw it as a complete violation of production etiquette and himself personally. Nimoy would file an injunction against Gene in an effort to stop him from using and selling the blooper reels, and would write various impassioned letters to the Great Bird of the Galaxy explaining why Roddenberry shouldn't continue to do what he had been doing with them all. Roddenberry in response offered Nimoy a copy of the blooper reel. He either didn't get what Nimoy was saying, or in fact did get it but simply didn't care and wanted to rub that fact in Nimoy's face. This is something we'll simply never know, but whatever the case, Nimoy's requests and challenges went ignored, and Gene continued to sell blooper reel after blooper reel whenever and wherever he could. Even with this failing relationship, Nimoy agreed to reprise the role of Spock on the new animated adventure, then titled Star Trek The Animated Adventures of Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek, Yes, long title. And in fact, most of the original cast would return to voice the characters that had made them all so famous in the live-action series. Actually, the return of Nichelle Nichols and George Takei would be thanks to Leonard Nimoy himself. In a bid to keep costs down by filmation, they had elected not to include those characters in this new production. Instead, having James Doohan voice the helmsman named Eryx and having Majel Barrett voice the new communications officer named Mares. When Nimoy heard this, however, he was livid and refused to take part in the show unless Takei and Nichols were included. And because of Spock's popularity, Filmation relented and those two important Star Trek fixtures were in fact included in the animated series. Ensign Chekhov, on the other hand, would not return for the show. With the added voices of Nichols and Takei, there simply wasn't the budget to include Walter Koenig, especially with Majel Barrett in the mix. So instead, Walter was given the job of writing an episode for the series, and he did just that, penning the episode The Infinite Vulcan. <laughs> 
but the series would see Mark Leonard reprise his role as Spock's father Sarek, Roger C. Carmel would return as Harry Mudd, and Stanley Adams would return as Cyrano Jones. Also to save money, the series would often reuse already animated cells. This meant that oftentimes an officer in the background would pop up for a few seconds and then suddenly be gone. Or one of the main characters suddenly had a totally different colored tunic while he recited his dialogue. The show also introduced a handful of new, never-before-seen technologies, like the recreation room, an idea that would blossom into the holodeck seen in Star Trek The Next Generation. And of course, the life support belts, an idea that would be completely scrapped after this series. Already established sets and equipment would once again reappear in the series, though some would see minor changes. The main bridge, for example, would see the addition of a second turbolift beside the main viewer, and the perimeter bridge consoles would become rounded, producing a circular effect instead of the original angular design. The animated series would also provide Uhura the rare instance of flexing her command muscle, when in the episode The Lorelei Signal, she valiantly takes command of the ship from Scotty when his mind and the minds of all the other male crew members aboard the Enterprise are compromised. We also get to see an all-female security team, something shocking at the time, but would further Star Trek's image of being socially responsible with looks to the future of humanity. The series was a success. In fact, it was so popular that even an anti-pollution public service announcement was created for a non-profit organization named Keep America Beautiful, featuring the animated series characters and original cast voices. The ad ran on Saturday morning programming during the entire series run. The main theme of the show with the animated series ran from September 1973 to October 1974, containing 22 episodes split into two seasons. The first season having 16 episodes, and the second season contained the remaining six episodes. Dorothy DC Fontana, a legendary woman for Star Trek in her own right, would return to Star Trek the Animated Series as co-producer and story editor. And for many Star Trek fans, the two animated seasons of this Star Trek series are seen as the last two years of Kirk's original five-year mission. But thanks to Gene Roddenberry himself, this stance would come into question, as he would flip-flop at conventions on the decision of whether the animated series was actually canon or not. Roddenberry was an excellent reader of a crowd, and as a result, when the question was asked about the animated series being canon, he would take the temperature of the room for a few seconds and then make the call. So here you suddenly had fans being told at one convention that it wasn't canon, while at another that it was. This would cause a permanent divide in the fan base that is in fact still felt today. Regardless of this, many references to the animated series have appeared in subsequent live-action Star Trek series, even some in Star Trek Discovery. So with each passing year, more and more fans are accepting that the animated series is actually canon. How this view will change when the two new upcoming animated series are released is still unknown. However, the question of the animated series itself being canon or not would finally be put to rest on June 27, 2007, when Paramount's official Star Trek website Wood includes the animated series in its library section declaring officially, and once and for all, that Star Trek the Animated Series was indeed canon, regardless of how the individual fan of Star Trek felt about it. The first recording session for the animated series was in June 1973, at Filmation Studios in California. This was the first time since 1969 that the original cast, minus Koning of course, had been reunited for anything, and they proceeded to record the first three episodes of the series. And at the Emmy Awards for the 1974-75 television year, Star Trek the Animated Series would win the Emmy for Best Children's Series. This was the first Emmy won for the Star Trek franchise, 
and Gene Roddenberry viewed the award as absolute proof that Star Trek was still a viable show. An interesting little Trek trivia tidbit for you all, I found, was in regards to the color pink appearing in the series. You might have noticed, if you had watched the show, that it contains an awful lot of pink. This was because Hal Sutherland, director of the production staff, was colorblind and viewed pink as gray. The production staff of the animated series was unaware of his condition, so when he picked out what seemed to be a gray color to him, the staff assumed he actually wanted it pink. Hence the abundant use of that color in the series. The animated series would get even more exposure when Alan Dean Foster would release expanded versions of each episode in his Star Trek Logs novels. Released in 10 volumes, most of these novels would feature three animated episodes per book. However, later editions would see the half-hour scripts expanded into full novel-length stories. If you're a fan of the animated series, I suggest you check out these Star Trek Logs. Having most of them in my own collection, they are very interesting additions to the Star Trek universe, and actually give an expanded and unexpected dimension to each of the animated series episodes. With his contract for the animated series with Filmation complete, Gene Roddenberry now turned his attention to Star Trek's next step in its evolution, a new live-action series he tentatively titled Star Trek Phase 2. Phase 2 was intended to bring the Starship Enterprise and her crew back to the small screen as the flagship show for a new network that the powers that be were developing at Paramount. But with the release of a little movie called Star Wars, Star Trek's future would end up on its first roller coaster ride that would lead Star Trek to finally return as a motion picture. A movie that would both succeed and fail in one of the biggest oxymorons that Star Trek would ever create. Thank you for watching today's episode of Backtrack. What do you think of Star Trek the Animated Series? What's your favorite animated series episode and why? Well, leave your comments in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. When we next return to Star Trek's history, we'll take a look at the creation of Star Trek The Motion Picture, and how even though technically a success, it was still a failure. If you want to help the channel out with its own blooper reels, then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching. Live long and prosper. Our sensors indicate a huge whirling belt of alien matter approaching the Enterprise at warp 6. Red alert. Repeat. Red alert. Activate view screen, Mr. Sulu. What you're looking at, Captain, is the Rombian pollution belt formed hundreds of years ago. Wasn't it before people became aware of pollution and began pointing it out? Exactly. Once enough people started pointing out pollution, the pollution stopped. Yes, Mr. Spot. People finally got the point. <laughs>